novels she's narrated. Please welcome Brittany Presley to the Listen Here podcast. Hey there. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm excited to talk about some of these books. We are so excited for one of your latest projects with HarperCollins, which is A Place to Land. But another fan favorite of your work is the romantic comedy Without a Hitch. Did you approach the two projects differently? And if so, how? So you asked specifically about A Place to Land and Without a Hitch, two wonderful, awesome books, but um, that could not be more different. So, but truly for me, um, regardless of the genre, I approach narration, I come at it from a pretty consistent place. Um, Very simple, very just, I break it down in the beginning, my who, what, where, when, and why. I'm looking at the story. I'm trying to, who are these characters? What's their motivation? What's going on? And then I'm diving into the emotion and the, the, you know, the drive, the the motivations, the the emotional urges, I guess, that the characters are experiencing. Because to me, as a narrator, that's what I feel I'm able to bring to the story is that emotion, that those feelings, um, which are not always, which are not always completely explicit, I guess, in the writing, but it's there in the subtext. Um, And so I'm searching for subtext always. Um, So regardless of the kind of of kind of book I'm doing, um, I'm trying to bring as much emotional impact to the story and to the audiobook as possible because I feel as though that's what is really engaging to a listener. Um, is that sort of performative aspect and that that ability to really express all these feelings that these characters are going through. You know, without a hitch is super fun. It's it's a romantic comedy. It's light. It gets it gives me an opportunity to to be comedic and to have that, you know, fun. I get to play around with an accent. Um a place to land is, you know, it's it's a mystery. It's literary fiction. Um you know, it's also we got past and present. Um, so, you know, without a hitch is a, a, a bit more straightforward in how I approach it. I would say the challenge to something like a place to land is that we are going back and forth in time and we are looking at two characters or these characters from different points in their lives spanning, you know, I think they're in their early 20s and then they're like in their late 60s, early 70s. So the the main challenge with that is being able to give the voice and the tone and the, um, you know, the feeling of these women at two very different points in their lives, in their lifetimes, and making sure that those distinctions are clear and discernible to the listener so that they know right away when we are in you know, one time frame versus the another versus another one, um, without making them t- two different characters. You know, the young woman and the older woman need to be the same person. So it's finding, you know, this gets a little more technical, but it's finding those kind of micro shifts in my actual voice and tone that indicate that we're, you know, in the past versus the present and keeping that super clear for the listeners without making it such a strong distinction that it starts to become, you know, cartoonish. You, you never want to go something that feels too extreme in your effort to to make them distinct that it kind of feels like they're not real people anymore. You want to take them seriously. You want to give them the respect and dignity um, that they deserve in both time frames. Um, so making that vocal distinction clear but not too dramatic. It's a fine line to walk. So question two, do you have a favorite genre that you like to narrate for? And how do you select which projects you work on? I don't really have a favorite genre. Um, It kind of vacillates, you know, every, not to be, oh, there, I love them all. That's a very diplomatic answer. But, um, you know, everything brings its own kind of joy. I think that 
I'm super lucky. I feel really grateful that I do get to narrate a variety of things. Um, I think, honestly, anytime you've been doing a lot of one, one particular genre, when you get something totally different, it feels like, oh, so refreshing, so exciting. And then you get too much in that, you know, I'll, I'll be doing really upbeat romantic comedies one after the next and then I'll get like a murder book and I'm like oh thank thank goodness for some murder <laughs> but then you know the flip side of that is you, you do a bunch of really heavy books and you're like oh it's so you it can be really emotionally taxing to be in these really heavy dark grim stories and all you want is just a nice happily ever after so um you know they all have their own benefits and I, and I just feel really excited that I get to play so many different kinds of characters across such a wide variety of genres. Um, As for how I select the projects that I'm working on, um, I would love to have an amazing answer for that. But, you know, this is my job. (laughs) And so it's honestly scheduling. You know, I wish there was a more um, exciting, artistic answer. But a lot of it just comes down to scheduling and what I'm available for at the time. And I am someone who does not like to say no. So, um, you know, if a great story comes along, if there's any way for me to make it possible, I will make it work. Um, So can sometimes lead to burnout when you're overworking yourself. But uh, I just I love it so much that I never want to say no, because I just love to tell all the stories. What benefits do you think the audience get when they listen to audiobooks like A Place to Land and Without a Hitch versus simply reading the books? I think audiobooks are just such a wonderful complement um, to, you know, the written word. Um, storytelling and oral storytelling, it's just been part of our being or as human beings, you know, we have wanted to sit around and listen to people tell stories. Um, I think that, you know, the benefits, I guess, from an audiobook versus just simply, you know, reading the words on the page is that, I mean, other than just, you know, the the efficiency, we are a, we are a culture of multitaskers. So it's nice to be able to, like, have someone tell you a story while you're doing your dishes. And we don't often have the luxury of being able to, like, sit down and, you know, indulge ourselves in just turning the page, which I do love. And I think that is a very important thing. Um, But I think with also with audiobooks, at least for me, um, again, everybody has a different approach. Everyone has their different tastes as far as what they like out of a narrator and what they don't like. Um, You know, there are some folks who just want to hear a beautiful voice, read them a story, and they want to keep it neutral and just have those, you know, smooth, dulcet tones tell them a tale. Um, I really try to, uh, I kind of approach my narration like a cinematic experience. Like I'm trying to give the listener short of, you know, Foley and sound effects, which even now they're starting to do in audiobooks and I think it's amazing. Um, you know, give the listener a full sonic cinematic experience, hearing all those different voices, letting the, letting the full breadth of the story come alive, um, in a way that, you know, can happen when you're when you're reading on the page. Certainly our minds are very active and vivid. But I think that when you have an audiobook and I don't know, sometimes I think maybe the humor you get to hear someone tell the joke, you know, something like without a hitch, like she's got her sassy southern accent and, you know, there's jokes and there's rhythm. And I think sometimes, you know, the comedy really is allowed to shine a little bit more in a way um that maybe you might be missed a, a little bit when you're just reading it to yourself. Um, there's something to be said about, you know, things are funnier when you're with someone else. You know, if you're watching a film by yourself, I feel like it's you laugh more when someone else is in the room. And there's something also in that same vein, like I think someone telling you that joke or you hearing that joke, it, it just sort of sparks something else that maybe, you know, wouldn't be as strong when you're just reading it off the page. So I think that audiobooks, you know, are are just a great way of just expanding the world, just just highlighting and bringing to life the words on the page. And last but not least, do you have any advice for someone looking to become a voice actor and narrator? Advice for anyone who is thinking about pursuing a career as a narrator or in voiceover? 
Number one, take classes. Take classes, take classes, take classes, get a coach, do one-on-ones, do group classes. I read out loud. I mean, that sounds so basic, but I think people underestimate just, hey, grab the book that you're currently working, you know, that you're currently reading for fun and read it out loud because you'd be surprised how different it can feel. Even if you, you know, it's like even when they say like people are giving a speech, like it's important not to just say it to yourself. You have to say it out loud. That's what we're doing. Um, And it feels very different. You will find beats and shifts and pacing and, and subtext, you know, going back to the subtext, things that you You'll discover things about the story when you say them out loud. Things that maybe not you don't notice as much when you're just reading it with your eyes. You start to say it out loud and it's like, oh, something else clicks in. So, you know, just practice reading out loud. Find some coaches. Find some classes. There's a number of really talented, experienced narrators who offer coaching. Um, Link up with them, you know, now with everything being available virtually, you have so many, so many more options than, you know, when it used to just be kind of like the main hubs were New York and L.A. And if you weren't in them, you weren't in those two places, you know, it was harder to find those networks. But now there's everybody's everywhere. Um, I really think um, group classes, while they might feel a little bit more intimidating, I really encourage those because I think You can learn so much by watching other people work, by listening to the choices they make, by listening to the feedback they get from the coach. It might be something, you know, that makes you go, oh, do I do that or should I do that? So I think that group classes, if you have access to them, are 100% um, the way to go. And then there's also a woman named Karen Comans who has created kind of a an ebook document that's uh, called The Narrator's Roadmap. And I know she includes a lot of really helpful information about getting started and some of the some of the more like logistical things. Um, So I would recommend checking that out. And then the last thing I would just say is this isn't exactly advice per se, but it's just understand that this is a labor of love, but it is a labor. And it's a lot of work. Um, Narrators work really dang hard. We are working nonstop in some ways, if we're lucky. But, you know, from reading and prepping the material to the actual recording of it, to keeping sharp on our skills, to promoting the books, promoting ourselves, looking for work, looking for our next project, you know, there's, it's a lot of work. And, you know, you have to have a strong... You have your hustle muscle must be strong. It takes, especially in the beginning, you have to hustle really hard. Um, the great thing is that, you know, in the last few years, there's so many more people who are able to narrate, but that also means there's so many more people who are narrating. So you've got a lot of competition out there. So it's not for the faint of heart. And you have to really have a a strong will and, you know, a, a really good work ethic to stay on top of your projects, be pursuing new, be working on one project while pursuing another project, while prepping another project that's coming up. You have to be really spinning a lot of plates. Um, So I just, I want people to understand that it's a wonderful, awesome job, but it is definitely not, as I've heard, an quote unquote, easy way to make money. Um, If that's what you're looking for, then let me know when you find it because I've yet to find an easy way to make money. But um, (laughs) but yes, it's a wonderful career, but anyone that is thinking about pursuing it, you know, it's going to take a lot of work. But if you're willing to do the work, then you can have a really, really rewarding career. Thank you again to Brittany Presley for taking the time to answer a couple of our questions. We're going to hop straight into some audiobook samples. Now, let's hear a sample of Without a Hitch. Sweet Home Alabama meets Emily in Paris in this hilarious romp through the world of extravagant Southern weddings. Ringless, jobless, and hopeless, Lottie Jones commits to doing the only thing she truly studied in school, wedding planning. When floundering and unlucky in love 20-something, Lottie Jones lands a new career as a wedding planner at a top-tier boutique event firm. 
she begins navigating a cutthroat workplace specializing in over-the-top details, unlimited budgets, and a broad spectrum of taste. Whether planning for parachute landings or wrangling intoxicated groomsmen, she has her hands full at every million dollar wedding she helps organize. After her boss announces he's opening a new office, Lottie sees her chance to finally carve out her place and earn an income that justifies her dating app subscription fees. The weddings get bigger, the clients get wilder, the mishaps get funnier, and the stakes get higher. And Lottie's forced to discover what she'll risk for love and how far she'll go to find herself. Set against the glamorous, ruthless world of high-end Southern weddings and inspired by real events in the author's lives, Without a Hitch is a hilarious romp about taking ownership, facing fears, planning your ex-boyfriend's wedding, and choosing a happy ending that wasn't what you once expected. Now, here's a sample of Without a Hitch, narrated by Brittany Presley. A lady's imagination is very rapid. It jumps from admiration to love, from love to matrimony in a moment. Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. You know who those who can't do teach? Those who can't wed, plan. The Wedding Planner. The right man for you might be out there right now, and if you don't grab him, someone else will. And you'll have to spend the rest of your life knowing that someone else is married to your husband. When Harry Met Sally. Prologue. What kind of person would plan her wedding without a proposal? The kind who ended up single, sweaty, and salty on the intended date, that's who. I took another gulp of Chardonnay, inhaled the scents of fresh-cut grass and Harper's Marlboros, and watched my three best friends dance on the sidewalk. An iPod and Bluetooth speaker blared, since you've been gone. Brightly colored Mexican moo-moos stuck to their backs in the humid night air. They toasted Cinco de Mayo, graduation, and the future, shiny as a new penny. I leaned back on the cool concrete steps of the Texas Christian University Chapel and closed my eyes for a moment. The screw-top bottle dripped condensation between my bare feet. On loop in my head ran the inescapable thought. This was supposed to be my wedding day. Lottie, get your butt over here! Natalia, one of my soon-to-be former housemates, yelled. I waved the Chardonnay at her in dismissive reply. Suit yourself, Megan said with a shimmy of her narrow purple hips and a toss of her dark brown curls. But this may be the last night we're all together, like forever. Quit being such a party pooper, it's graduation, Harper said. You have dancing to do, drinks to consume, and an ex to get over. One day, four years of dating will feel like nothing, said Natalia, ever the optimist. This will just be a blip on your radar, a step on your way to your actual fabulous life. Preferably with someone rich and famous who loves you, Jesus, and his mama, Harper winked. Maybe someday you won't even feel like such an idiot for planning your wedding years before Brody ever, I mean, never proposed, Megan said. I don't think it's idiotic, just very, very committed. Natalia smiled broadly albeit unconvincingly. Teeth white against golden brown cheeks. Maybe more like deserving to be committed, said Harper, arching a thin brow. Lovely, very funny. Thanks, y'all. I knew they were trying to be helpful, however drunkenly. Three years, nine months, and three weeks prior, I had met Brody Stevens during freshman orientation. The football team let the players out of two-a-days long enough to figure out where their classes would be and to meet enough cute girls to stay motivated during muggy pre-dawn practices. Funny, I couldn't remember the exact moment we met. Only that by the end of my third day of college, his six-foot-three frame had hauled all my textbooks to the freshman girls' dorm from the campus bookstore. Brody was hilarious ambitious, and smarter than most guys who had their heads bashed every day for a decade. Confident in the way all handsome men were confident, but with the endearing hint of insecurity that remained when your growth spurt hit at the tail end of puberty. He behaved like the gentleman his Baton Rouge mama intended, 
and he kissed with a certain, well, expertise. We bonded over both being from the dodgy suburbs of our respective towns and scholarship students in the middle of a country club set. He worked hard to earn his spot in the starting lineup and somehow found time and energy to push me to excel too. I'd spent our first couple of months together wondering why he picked me. If I scrolled through my social media profiles or mental images of the last four years, his goofy grin appeared in nearly every frame. Every friendship, every club, every milestone was shared. We were Brody and Lottie, campus sweethearts, all-conference quarterback and student association vice president. We had shed our working-class histories quicker than we dropped our heavily twanged accents. Okay, yes, we'd even won homecoming king and queen. I knew deep down that it was due to our ethos, the aura surrounding our relationship, and not because I was especially beloved. But Brody was. All of campus and the entire alumni association got to fall in love with him every fall Saturday for four years. I certainly did. Sophomore year. My sorority great grand big. Yeah, I know, I know. Got married in the TCU chapel, and I manned the guest book. Daydreaming through the vows, I imagined us at the altar instead. We'd been saying I love you for several months and using phrases like after school, even though it seemed on some distant horizon. But two weeks later, when Brody mentioned our kids, I called the campus wedding coordinator. I looked at the calendar and found a slim window between the NFL draft, graduation, and training camp. As every undergrad hopeful knew, if I wanted to get married in the chapel, I'd need to book it well in advance. Two years was plenty of time for him to get around to proposing. I could even deduct the $200 fee from my on-campus spending account. Genius! Thus, with little fanfare or effort, May 5th, the Saturday after graduation, was on the books. I slowly and systematically tied my future to Brody's with the subtlest of threads. By junior year, the planning had gone well beyond our vows. He'd play in the NFL, and I'd be a card-carrying member of the Wives and Girlfriends Club. Law school could wait. It had to, since, of course, he could be drafted anywhere. I channeled all my organizational skills and energy into this new plan. I continued with my English and poli-sci double major, minoring in women's studies, but never took the LSAT, stopped applying for honor societies, and subscribed to Martha Stewart weddings. Good thing Brody never knew about the wedding date I'd set for us, which I had quietly let go a couple months prior, promising to call the campus coordinator again when the time was right. At least I was spared that particular humiliation. And since I'd caught the roommates eyeing beholden bridesmaids' dresses a time or two, I took small comfort that I wasn't the only one who felt confident that the day would come. Instead, I had no grad school, job, fellowship, internship, or relationship on the horizon, and no clue what to do next. Incredible! And now it was May 5th, so here my girlfriends and I danced. We'd donned moo-moos from our spring break trip to Acapulco, feasted on Tex-Mex at Joe T's, and eventually ended up wandering the campus. We found ourselves at the site and on the night of my imagined intended nuptials. As I sat on the chapel steps, itchy from mosquitoes, I replayed how a week ago, two days before we donned our caps and gowns, Brody had come over to do the deed. No, not that deed. The one that involved tears and a lot of, I just don't think I can balance our relationship with my rookie season and... You'd be so bored while I played and traveled all the time. I pathetically tried to explain how low maintenance I was. It wasn't like he'd have to babysit me. I could work, get a job in whatever city he was drafted. We could make friends and build a life there together. I groveled. Basically did everything short of lying prostrate. It wasn't enough. Basically did everything short of lying prostrate. It wasn't enough. Natalia ripped a handful of roses from the bush next to the chapel doors and bunched together a sloppy bouquet. Hold these. She thrust them into my hand. She tucked a long, dark lock behind her ear, yanked me from the steps, and led me to the end of the sidewalk near the street. 
she cued my tipsy band of maids who began to hum, Here Comes the Bride. It was supposed to be canon and D, I mumbled, walking with her down the sidewalk aisle. Right together, left together, right. Arm in arm we strolled, summer locusts whirring in accompaniment. As we reached the steps, Harper clambered to the top to lead the ceremony, a cigarette dangling from her lips, bouncing as she spoke and nearly igniting a few chin-length blonde strands. We are gathered together tonight to celebrate the union of Lottie and her freedom. Lottie, I mean, Charlotte, do you solemnly swear never to go back to that jerk to, um, find somebody better to... Never to let him touch her forevermore, Natalia said helpfully. Yes, yes, that for sure. And also to find someone else richer and handsomer and just all around better? Harper finished. I do, I said solemnly. I raised my right hand, pale in the glow of the streetlight. By the powers vested in me by the state of Texas in this fine College of Arts and Sciences, I now pronounce you a single lady. You may now take a shot. With that, my three housemates cheered. Brody is a jerk, I thought, while Harper and Megan began to dance some tequila-infused semblance of the Macarena across the chapel porch. As I stood on the stoop clutching my crumpled bouquet, my friends moved to the bottom, mock wrestling for a chance to catch the toss. Sticky, disheveled, mostly shoeless, some holding half-empty bottles. All perfect. I guess I'd known on some level they would be by my side today no matter what. I blinked, the click of a shutter, framing them in my memory. I slowly turned back to my friends, inhaled deeply, and let the tattered flowers fly. One. Seven years later. An azalea branch jabbed my thigh and my heels sank into the mulch. Sweat trailed down my back and I realized wearing a black silk dress to an outdoor wedding in July was a mistake as I squatted behind the ornamental shrubbery of the Dallas Arboretum and Botanical Garden. Guests filed past our hiding spot. They fanned themselves as they searched for seats, oblivious to our presence. At my left, hunched the groom, his pale face flushed and dripped while he yanked on his stiff collar. Good. This whole debacle was his fault anyway. I could hear my new boss, Cedric, squawking orders at the caterers over the walkie-talkie. Any minute now, he'd give me the go-ahead to dispatch the groom, Cole Parker McNeil. All planners need to be in position for the ceremony. I repeat, all planners in position. Cedric's voice boomed over my walkie-talkie. Operation Wingman has officially begun. We're five minutes and counting from go time. The groom's only job was to show up on the big day, on time with a big smile plastered on his face and, if possible, sober. Most would probably have preferred to have a stunt double stand in at the altar so they could keep sipping their flasks in the green room with the groomsmen. But Cole actually got his very own stunt double. Instead of walking down the aisle, Cole had a vision of arriving by helicopter. Yes, a helicopter, but he didn't want to do the jumping himself. Unwittingly, Cole was also starring in my first official wedding at the firm known to outsiders as Cedric Montclair Celebrations. The scent of my anxious desperation mingled with my body odor. Abigail Benton, my former boss at a floral design boutique for nearly six years, had sold her company to Cedric Montclair's mega-event production and planning conglomerate that summer. Architecturally inspired floral design was her specialty, and Cedric wanted to stop outsourcing that segment of the business. She made bank, but all I got was a $500 bonus and a, you're welcome to come too, I'm sure Cedric can find a place for you. It was a no-brainer, as my massive student loans weren't vanishing anytime soon. So I hunched in the bushes, tasked with helping pull off one of the spring's biggest Texas nuptials. The bride, Gemma, was practically Southern aristocracy. 
Her ancestors had turned West Texas cotton farming into a global textiles business. But the company recently halted production due to rising U.S. manufacturing costs, and her family had high hopes for this union with the Parker McNeil venture capitalists. Despite drawing shrubbery duty, I'd been in awe most of the day. Both the bride and groom wanted to make an impression, which a million-dollar budget could achieve. Every last detail for their 500 guests had been customized and special-ordered from all over the world. The clients donated a six-figure sum to the botanical garden in order to secure the space for their ceremony and reception. It was almost impossible to shut down the entire gardens for an event, but an exception was made since Cole and Gemma had been so very generous. The ceremony was set outdoors in one of the more secluded areas. Guests would leave the secret garden and move to the reception in a multi-level tent a structure that had been under construction for almost two weeks leading up to the event. The vast majority of these elaborate details fell to Gemma, her mother, and Cedric's team. Usually this arrangement was ideal for all parties involved, I'd learned. Most men, grooms and fathers alike, were best left out of the planning process entirely, except for occasionally being allowed to help with stocking the bar, selecting the band, and, of course, signing the checks. Most men were relieved by this, but not this groom. Cole wanted to make a grand gesture of his own. Typically, the bride was supposed to steal the show with her dramatic entrance, but she surprised us and acquiesced. If I'd had to hazard a guess, after a childhood of boarding school, equestrian lessons, debutante balls, and other requisite activities of the Southern gentry, she'd had enough of feeling like a stuffed turkey and was happy to concede the spotlight. The planning team was slightly worried Gemma would be a letdown after the groom made his impressive entry, but we always tried to accommodate the client's wishes. In this case, that meant aviation. The processional started as usual, but at the moment when the groom would typically walk out, the music suddenly stopped. Cedric approached the microphone at the front of the ceremony and announced that the groom was missing. Muffled sounds of dismay reached our perch, a precisely plotted 15 seconds later, the Mission Impossible theme song blared through the speakers, and the whir of a hovering helicopter filled our ears. I stuck my head out of the hedge just enough to see the stunt double jump from the chopper 200 feet above us. Are you ready? I handed the real Cole the helmet and checked his parachute backpack. Huh? What? He startled from staring at the guests through the branches. Wow, we're really doing this, he gulped. Are you ready to run out there? We have about 60 seconds, give or take. Stood, dazed, his eyes as terrified as if he were actually being forced to leap out of the chopper, sans parachute. Listen, Cole, I know everyone you know is out there, but focus on this one thing. You're marrying Gemma. If the band doesn't show or her mother throws a fit or the food is terrible... None of that matters. It's all just details. Obviously, Cedric would never allow any of that to happen regardless. I know, Cole said softly. My mama used to say that the only thing that will last other than pretty pictures is a marriage. So, do you love Gemma and want to marry her? Absolutely. She's my... well... my everything... He straightened his shoulders as much as the overhanging branches would allow and turned to me, resolve in his eyes. He grabbed the helmet. Let's do this. The stunt guy we'd hired from the skydiving school in McKinney landed on the path right behind us and ran to our hiding spot, disconnecting his parachute and abandoning it on the ground for effect. I grabbed the jumper and shoved Cole out the side. He jogged to the altar, arms raised in victory to the cheers of family and friends. Would Cole ever confess that he hadn't actually jumped from the helicopter? Doubtful. I had no idea where that pep talk had come from. I was the last person to pass along inspirational quotes and starry eyes. Deep down, I still hoped some people found there forever. And it looked like I'd helped make that happen for Cole and Gemma. At least for today. Plus, I really needed things to go according to plan. For years, 
Abigail and I had designed Cedric's florals and even assisted with day of details, setting up arrangements before his long-standing team descended for the ceremony and reception. But this was the first time I'd worked on the main event. If anything, it was an audition to see if I could cut it with Cedric's prose and survive the merger. I'd unfortunately gone from Abigail's almost junior partner to a rookie in one fell swoop. Barring disaster, I'd be assigned to Mary Ellen Bovender, Cedric's number two in the planning division. Her most recent assistant had gotten married and stopped working entirely, right after Cedric did her wedding, of course. Rumor had it that the girl put in two years at the firm just to secure her premiere date. Now Mary Ellen needed help, and she didn't have time to train someone new with wedding season in full swing. When Abigail suggested me for the job, they were intrigued by the fact that I'd worked with Cedric's team in the past. They opted to throw me straight into the role and see if I could survive. What they didn't know was that my entire financial survival in Dallas was also contingent on surviving at the firm. As I stood on the path, admiring my coordinating handiwork, Mary Ellen marched over and grabbed my arm. Lizzie, you look disgusting. Have you seen yourself? You've got a sweat line down your back and circles under your arms. Uh, it's Lottie and... Sorry? Mary Ellen, however, seemed impervious. Her brunette blowout was shellacked in place, and her brow remained a dewy peach in contrast to my dripping flush. Ugh. Don't you know how to prevent that? You live in Texas. She handed me two thin panty liners she'd whipped from her bag. Here, stick these inside the pits of your dress and it will sop that right up. With that, she sauntered back to her original destination, and I crept to the bathroom while the ceremony continued. Baffled, I tried to figure out how the things worked, horizontally or vertically. I finally stuck them inside my underarms and hoped they didn't show. Lottie, please report to the tent, crackled over my earpiece. With panty liners in place, I dashed out of the bathroom. The reception tent was rigged with a custom lighting system that projected twinkling constellations in an evening sky. Every table had a massive floral centerpiece draped in lush white flowers and dripping with crystals. The china, crystal, and sterling silver were brought in from England. Fun fact, just one sterling place setting cost roughly 800 bucks. The gilded custom stage for the orchestra-style band would have been suited to a roaring 20s New York City ballroom. Ornamental bushes dotted the room, trimmed to resemble the constellations brought to life from the hunter to the Big Dipper. However, the crown jewel was the head table, a round, mirrored table underneath a huge hanging ring of white orchids, peonies, and crystals, and in front of a solid wall of 5,000 white roses and ranunculas. The sight was truly breathtaking. Just then, Cedric ducked over to check on the space. Oh, Libby, there you are. I desperately need someone with floral expertise or this tablescape will be ruined. One batch of hydrangeas must have been left in the truck or something and have already started wilting. Um, it's Lottie. Whatever. Come help me fix these centerpieces. They're positively tragic. A flair for the dramatic, brilliant design chops and impeccable diction were not Cedric's only distinctive qualities. I pondered as I trailed him. He wore a fedora and designer sunglasses both day and night, indoors and outside, along with at least one Hermes accessory. This time it was an ascot. His salt and pepper hair was luxuriant, his designer clothes impeccably tailored. He also carried a tiny Yorkie, Prince Charles, or PC for short, anytime he wasn't at an event. In my years around Dallas's wedding world, I'd heard all about Cedric. He could execute parties that most people would never even imagine. Dallas socialites heaped hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars upon Cedric to plan and design their dream debutante ball, birthday soiree, wedding, or even the occasional baby shower. And not always in that order. His wait list, while choosier than the Vaquero Club, still stretched longer than traffic on the turnpike. Cedric employed a large staff of minions the project managers, floral designers, and production workers who made his visions come to life. 
working for Cedric, guaranteed a job anywhere in the event industry. He'd built a business from scratch to become the best of the best in our part of the world and was poised to join the ranks of the country's most prestigious planners. No wonder Abigail had leapt at the chance to go from his occasional floral contractor to a full-time team member. But I felt woefully unprepared for this level of eventing. Still, it was time to prove myself proficient to Cedric in the one area of wedding details I already understood. Fixing expensive flowers. All the tables were named after constellations, and we faced the offending centerpieces at the Big Dipper and the Little Bear. In the scheme of big day disasters, this was minor. Cedric waved his hands at the bothersome bouquets and winced. Don't worry, I can fix this. I grabbed the closest caterer and sent him for a cup of boiling hot water from the kitchen. I pulled out the wilting hydrangeas one by one, recut their stems, dipped them into the boiling water for about 30 seconds, and then placed them back into the arrangements. It took a few minutes, but this trick would perk the flowers right up at least for the next hour or so. Didn't people know hydrangeas were the absolute most finicky flowers? I also grabbed some floral wire to prop up some of the worst offenders. At least they weren't dead. There was no resurrecting a bloom once it had completely wilted. As I worked, half forgetting that Cedric was breathing over my shoulder, rearranging the most leafless to the inside and plucking petals off the seats, the arrangements started to resume their intended shapes. Clapping sounded right next to my ear. I almost knocked over the closest vase. I was so startled. Raw bow, Libby. Those look marvelous. With that, he hustled away. I wiped the sweat from my forehead. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for my armpit panty liners. Then returned to my post at the rear of the tent. As the ceremony ended... I stood by Abigail waiting at attention. Her long braids piled atop her head and off her neck. Smart. And her dark brown complexion, I noted, was as unaffected as Mary Ellen's. What did these women know that I didn't? Guests streamed in from cocktail hour to the seated dinner. We were on table directing duty for the moment. To accompany the theme of The Secret Garden Meets the Great Gatsby in Outer Space with... James Bond parachuting vibes thrown in. The seating cards were vintage paddle fans for the men and vintage lace folding fans for the women, both dotted with Swarovski crystal constellations and the names embossed in gold script. The constellation table names, while clever, meant that no one could look for the numbers near theirs to find the right spot. Lots of rich people wandered around, holding fans up to table centerpieces and appearing puzzled. We tried to help when we could. Thanks for handling those flowers. Abigail nudged my shoulder. I've told him over and over for years that hydrangeas can't take the heat, but he believes they will magically bend to his will one of these days. Seems like most things do bend to his will. Ha, huh, very true. The trick with Cedric is to pick your battles, and don't be afraid to fight the ones that matter. I've known him since he first came to Dallas. When you know what's right and it can make a difference, push back. His bite is pretty bad, but he rarely does more than bark. Thanks, I'll try to remember that next time, I said with the frantic hope that there would be a next time. Lottie, you're doing great. Don't stress so much about screwing up someone's wedding and just do the tasks in front of you. Working with Abigail had truly been a dream. She had the kind of warm aura that you want to snuggle up to. I was anxious about no longer being her direct report, but was grateful she'd still be around the office. Yes, ma'am, I nodded. How many times do I have to tell you don't call me ma'am? She laughed, brown eyes twinkling. Now go help those poor guests find their way to their constellation. Next time I'm going to insist on regular table numbers. I headed over to the seating assignment table to gauge guests' progress and see how many people had yet to pick up their fans. As my eyes scanned the names, they stumbled upon one I'd hoped not to see for a long time. Mr. Matthew McKenzie, in calligraphic flourish. Crap. I'd have to avoid him at all costs, which wouldn't be a problem. Blending into the background was a primary reason why we wore black at weddings. Once guests finally found their seats, dinner service was prompt and the catering team operated like a well-oiled machine. 
three-course gourmet meals to 500 people was no small feat. I watched in awe as Mary Ellen seamlessly directed the happy couple through their cake cutting and first dances, while also instructing the necessary vendors involved. She was clearly a pro. I had a lot to learn about wedding planning. An hour later, I spotted Matt across the tent near a group of guests on the dance floor. Wavy brown hair, tall with deep-set hazel eyes, and the shoulders of a swimmer under his crisply tailored tuxedo. Yep, still made my stomach clench. I ducked behind a screen. From my hiding spot, I strategized how to avoid him all night. Matt started to turn in my direction, so I jerked my head back, right into cold, hard metal. Ouch! I pivoted to face what turned out to be a camera lens, then gazed up into a scruffy dark beard and wide, horrified brown eyes. Gosh, I'm so sorry. I frowned and rubbed my skull. Couldn't you have given me a heads up? Sorry, I'm supposed to stay out of sight, so this is one of the best angles on guests without being in their way. I thought you saw me when you came back here. Obviously not, I interjected. Well, when you leaned out, it meant I could too. I didn't expect you to jump back like you saw a ghost. I sized him up while I checked for blood. Heavy work boots and dark, not quite skinny jeans. In Dallas, straight men are known to walk a fine line between slim fit and too tight. Tight black v-neck that belied a solid, albeit lanky frame. Thick, unruly black hair. Puppy dog eyes behind retro glasses and enviably tanned, tawny skin. All in all, the prototype of a Dallas hipster nerd. Of course he was a photographer. I'm Griffin. He extended the hand that wasn't wielding the camera. I work with Val. Like most other wedding vendors, good photographers came with a team of their own. This couple had hired one of the top photogs in the state, Valeria Trujillo. She had started shooting for magazines before most of these brides and grooms were born. After a climbing injury on a National Geographic shoot, she'd scaled back to covering events. Her rates were still upward of $25,000, but the health risks were far less. But when couples got photos by Val, they were usually getting a mixture of her takes and her entourage of promising young photographers, eager for the chance to learn from a master. While she prominently roamed an event, her assistant's job was to sneak around and capture candid shots. I only knew all this because of a feature in D Weddings I'd thumbed through during a slow night at Neiman's, my side hustle workplace until recently. I'm Lottie. I took his proffered hand. When I'm not having my skull beaten in, I work with Cedric. I crossed my fingers and hoped that was the truth. So you're one of the trust fund girls who parade around with clipboards while the grunts do all the work, huh? Before I could craft a dismissive retort, I got a call over the walkie to come out behind the main tent. Nah, you couldn't be more wrong, but excuse me, I've got to go be one of those grunts now. I said, as I waved a hand over my shoulder and hustled away. I was absolutely going to have a knot on my head. Many thanks, Griffin. One of the new interns, Claire, paced outside the tent, freckled cheeks pale and terrified. I had just met Claire a week ago when she was assigned to help me help Mary Ellen. I didn't know her well yet, but she seemed competent enough. My adrenaline started pumping when I saw her face. Lottie, we need you down at the dock she said, close to tears. There's been an accident. I didn't bother asking what kind of accident, just hustled down the path to the water as fast as possible in heels. An elderly grandparent could have tumbled down the steps, or something worse, so I barely noticed my surroundings in the mad dash. The night smelled like wet moss and roses. Hidden ground lights lent the path an otherworldly glow. No wonder people found this place magical. Cole and Gemma were supposed to end the night floating across White Rock Lake in a vintage wooden rowboat that cost more than most people's cars. The fireworks would burst above them, and a few subtle spotlights would make it possible to snag a final round of photographs as they rowed into the moonlight. Cedric's new batch of interns had been tasked with tying a just-married sign to the back of the boat and getting it into position. But the boat came untied, probably while they all took selfies on the job.
and was now floating away. All the other helpers were back in the main tent, wrangling guests and getting the bride and groom ready for their final dance. The interns freaked out, unsure how to fix the situation. So they called me. I'd like to think it was my zen-like unflappability, but more likely they hoped that as a fellow low rung on the totem pole, I might berate them less for the mistake. They weren't necessarily wrong, but only if we could fix this. All the pleasure boats available for rent on a normal day at the Arboretum had been hauled away for the event. I scanned the shoreline, hoping for a stray canoe or something. As I stood there, Griffin, who had followed me down from the tent, spoke up. When I was scouting the angles earlier, I saw some of the kids' boats docked not too far from here. With no other option presenting itself other than swimming out into a dark lake in the middle of the night, I turned in Griffin's direction. Lead the way, buddy. As we rounded the corner, I saw the boats Griffin had referred to. He'd neglected to mention that they were paddle boats, and they were all shaped like swans. Swans! White, textured wings flanked the sides, and a long neck and head arched over the passengers. The paddle itself, ignominiously pedaled by said passengers, was orange and made to look like webbed feet. The overall effect was hideous and tacky, and I could understand why Cedric had mandated they be completely out of sight of the guests. Nevertheless, I was out of options. I untied the closest bird boat and climbed in, then slipped off my heels so I could paddle. Before I could push away, Griffin hopped in next to me. You really don't have to. It's no problem. We'll go faster with two. The hipster had a point. We pointed the bird across the moonlit water and pedaled as hard as we could. We had about 30 minutes before the wedding party trekked down to the water, ready to send off the happy couple. Once again, I was grateful for the panty liners soaking up my sweat. Too polite and Southern not to make small talk, a religion in its own right. I spoke over the sound of splashing paddles. So, what's your deal? Where are you from? I'm from Austin. You? Memphis, but I came here to go to TCU. Very cool. I went to a and It was hard to get enough breath to speak, but I managed. So, how did you get into wedding photography? Well, I'm not really into wedding photography, he wheezed. I'd rather shoot nature or editorial stuff than these, inhale, overpriced brouhaha's. Like, it's a lot of money to blow on a party. Why bother? But I've always been a fan of Val's older work, so when I got the chance to work with her, it seemed foolish not to take it. There were about three points in there to address, starting with why people might bother getting married. But before I could interject, he continued. How did you get into weddings? He smirked. Just biding your time until your own big day? Did everybody in town know that that was a thing for Cedric staffers? No. Yes, but I could pretend that zero marital prospects meant I just loved the work. After college, I started working with a florist who ended up becoming one of Cedric's partners. I followed her here. It's not really where I thought I'd end up either, but here I am. He nodded, then quietly gazed at the water. I tried not to quietly gaze at the way his shirt pulled tight across his shoulders as he leaned into paddling or to inhale too deeply as his woodsy cologne floated on the breeze, which was a challenge amid all the huffing and puffing. Just because I'd sworn off dating, refocusing my priorities didn't mean I couldn't appreciate the rare opportunity to be, you know, near a man. After what felt like eons, we finally pulled up next to the wooden boat. How had it gotten so far in such a brief amount of time? Thank goodness we hadn't tried to swim out. We'd have needed that helicopter back for a lake rescue. We gingerly stepped inside, grateful to be out of the paddle boat that was beginning to make my calves burn. I sat in front while Griffin tied the swan to the back of the boat. Then he picked up the oars to row us back to the dock. I glanced at my watch. Ten minutes left. Cedric timed his weddings with the precision of a drill sergeant. There would be no extra time. I covertly watched while Griffin strained at the oars. 
Lugging around a heavy camera had certainly done his biceps good. Had I not been sweating profusely, this could almost feel like a date. We pulled up to the dock just as the revelers reached the top of the path. Their sparklers glittered in the shadows cast by the trees. I tied the wooden boat to the pylon, shooed Griffin into the bushes, and made a mad dash there myself. Guests lined the path as Cole and Gemma made their way through the row of lights. I could barely see them from my perch behind some ornamental shrubbery. My M.O. for the night, apparently. Griffin's job was to document their progress. Music played from hidden speakers. The overall effect was magical, celebratory, and thanks to a bit of quick aquatic prowess, seamless. The newlyweds climbed into the vintage boat. Cole grasped the oars, something he couldn't fake this time, and Gemma arranged her skirt just the way Mary Ellen had instructed her. They shoved off the dock, waving at their guests. It was the perfect goodbye. Then it hit me. I tried to run out onto the dock, but it was too late. Panicked, I glanced around. Maybe no one noticed my mistake. But then I saw Cedric and Mary Ellen at the top of the stairs, pointing toward the lake and looking bewildered. In my haste, I'd forgotten to untie the swan boat from the back of the getaway watercraft. As the bride and groom made their way to the center of the lake, under a canopy of fireworks, the hideous plastic bird trailed them. I moved my gaze across the group of guests starting to disperse, now that the send-off was complete. Many of them were chuckling as they headed back up the stairs. Of course, my eyes landed directly on Matt's face. He waved. Double crap. I was zero for two. I heard the sneaky click of a shutter, then whirled around. If you so much as show those photos to your boss or anyone, then I will end you. Pretend you missed the moment or something. Are you kidding me? He scoffed. The light and the fireworks are perfect. Can't you Photoshop the bird out? You people are always editing stuff in and out of photographs, right? It might not save my job, but it felt good to direct my frustration at someone. No way. Plus, my job is to capture the truth. Yours is to keep stuff like this from happening. Even though, I gotta say, it's pretty hilarious. Ugh. Maybe I'd need to find yet another backup plan if wedding coordination didn't work out. But as I gazed at the happy couple holding hands under the fireworks and their contented guests waving from the shore, I hoped deep down I'd get at least one more chance. Two. If any space could perk a girl up, it was the Cedric Montclair Celebrations Office. I hadn't heard anything from Cedric himself, but Mary Ellen had pulled me aside during the post-wedding teardown to tell me we would discuss the swan fiasco Monday. I considered not being fired on the spot a win. Big Saturday weddings compressed our entire weekend into one off Sunday and a late start on Monday. So around noon, I crawled through the oversized red lacquered doors, triple shot latte in hand. Months into the job, the space still felt to me like a beautiful Fifth Avenue boutique, one with glass desks and gold MacBook Airs. Everything was chic and sleek, white and red, Cartier red to be exact. The ambience made one feel sexy, like a million bucks, which was probably the precise intention. I, however, usually just felt reminded that I was, as legally defined by the IRS, broke. Cedric held court from his office near the two front meeting rooms, lined with brass bookcases and featuring a velvet chaise longue for brainstorming. It was immaculate and intimidating. A tiny white linen cushion rested on the floor next to Cedric's white desk, the only concession to his tiny Yorkie Prince Charles. PC traveled in his own tote bag most of the time, but was allowed the cushion when he was working with Cedric. From his domain, Cedric could witness the comings and goings of his staff and clients, and he didn't have to walk very far from the front door. If the man sounded a bit like a cliché, well, he leaned into it, God love him. But the man truly guarding entry to the Palace of Parties was Travis. He only worked for fun, whatever that meant as his partner was a top stylist who made a fortune dressing the wealthiest Dallasites. 
Travis had two Birkin bags, clearly gifts from his partner. It drove Cedric crazy with jealousy. One of the bags was white, which was a total power move because White said, I don't care if I get dirty, despite costing more than Travis made in a year. Though Travis was a glorified secretary, he was the most important person in town, if you were planning an event. He had the power to book a meeting with Cedric tomorrow or in two years, depending on his mood that day, and whether or not he liked you. He'd been around, seen it all, and could shut you out before the social season even started. Those bright blue eyes could laser in on a fake Louis Vuitton from 50 yards. He was invaluable as the firm's gatekeeper. Travis was at his post, bushy-tailed as always. Oh my god, how was your first wedding? I heard that the helicopter went off like a dream. Yes, I managed not to screw up anything with the ceremony, at least. Though I did send the couple across the lake dragging a swan-shaped paddle boat, which will be documented in Dallas' society pages forever. But they got married, which is a win, right? If you say so, Puffin. He patted my hand. Despite my lack of St. Laurent handbags or Valentino shoes, Travis had taken an instant liking to me. He was always willing to help out at least one of the new minions each year, especially those who, in his opinion, lacked a sense of personal style and taste. As offended as I should have felt by this, I considered myself lucky. Travis was always willing to give me his opinion on my attire and ask a million questions about my love life, or lack thereof. And despite my being somewhat of a pity project, I took pleasure in knowing he cared about me, in his way. Thanks, Travis. I trudged down the hall to my desk. Behind the meeting rooms was a large common area where most of the project managers and upper-level planners worked. Mary Ellen and Abigail were both ensconced there. Each had a glass desk, a white lacquer filing cabinet, and a few small clear cubes in which they could store pens and pencils, but not much else. Forget about a family photo or any personal knick-knack. If you put out anything remotely sentimental, you might as well start packing. Cedric wouldn't stand for it. From her perch, Mary Ellen could keep an eye on the junior staffers and Abigail. It was rumored that Mary Ellen had pitched a fit when Cedric brought Abigail to the team instead of simply buying her inventory and client list. Abigail had told me, grudgingly, that she and Mary Ellen had a bit of a fraught history. They disagreed over publication credits a couple times over the years. In the small, fiercely competitive world of high-end events, they were two alphas trying to survive, and working for Cedric was a dream job for those aspiring to make a career in the business. It might not have been personal, but the fact that Cedric put the two of them in a shared office showed that A, he didn't know about their tension, B, he had a wicked sense of humor, or C, he simply didn't give a rip. My vote was option C. Cedric definitely had a type. He preferred the ultra-polished girls who showed up in Chloe over average off-the-rack gals. When I got to college, I had highlighted my hair within an inch of its life in an attempt to fit in with my sorority sisters. I worked two nights a week at Neiman's to afford the dues. Jeans and a cute top, with heels, of course, were once the weekend uniform. But these days, my weekend uniform tended toward Nordstrom Rack funeral chic, and my hair had darkened back to its natural dishwater state. Only once had Cedric ever commented on how much he liked my outfit, and I considered those clothes sacred. Cedric is known for gifting his favorite employees with a pair of the latest Louboutin pumps, and it was painfully obvious who was in or out at the time based on the soles of their shoes. I would be waiting on mine for a long time, maybe forever, especially after the Swan incident. Past the common area was another open space, this time with fewer windows and a half dozen Parsons desks. Here sat the assistants. I slipped into my shared cubicle, thankful for a moment of quiet. Intern Claire, my newly assigned deskmate, likely wouldn't be in for hours. She and the other trustees, as I like to call the trust fund girls from Dallas, who frittered about the office, biding their time until their big payouts at 25 or 30, typically didn't show before 2 p.m. on Mondays. As trustees went, Claire didn't seem as bad as most, and I was trying to withhold a final judgment. Slim and smartly dressed, she had, like almost all of the other trustees, long blonde hair that was blown out every day. 
my mid-length dishwater main, got washed every three days at best. Thank you, Lord, for dry shampoo. However, unlike the others, Claire had a constant smile and one of those annoyingly cute faces, adorable dusting of freckles included, that drew you in. It could have been worse. Every day at Cedric Montclair celebrations was like stepping into the abyss. No one ever knew which version of Cedric would be waiting, or what other wild cards would walk through the door. Even Mary Ellen cringed behind her desk most mornings as he swept into the office, and they were supposed to be friends. In this case, the devil wore ascots. I sat at my desk, determined to work and not think about either of them. An email popped into my inbox from Matt. He'd seen me at the wedding and was disappointed we didn't get to talk. Oh, Matt. I recalled how two years ago, Natalia and I were celebrating Cinco de Mayo, as was our tradition, at a deep Elm bar. I typically marked the night with questionable amounts of alcohol and even more questionable decisions. I'd just turned 27, hello, late 20s and spinsterhood. Harper was married, and Megan had just started dating her now fiancé, making Natalia and me the last of our college group with no rings and no prospects. For the girl who was supposed to beat everyone else to the altar, it was the perfect recipe for wallowing in self-pity and desperation. I vaguely recalled sidling up to Matt's broad shoulders to order my third or fourth margarita. I usually fell asleep after two. Matt remarked how cute my moo, moo was. He had just finished business school at UT and was back at his parents' house for the summer before taking a big sports agency job in Miami. My memory got foggy. I was already three margaritas in, and he was really hot. As our respective groups whittled down, and my drinks accumulated, a sloppy makeout in the corner was inevitable. I wished I could say we had a deep connection, or even that the night was especially steamy. But all I really remembered was kissing at the bar, followed by an enormous hangover the next day. Less inevitable were the late-night drinks at Capitol Pub a few nights later. My mama used to say, a gentleman always calls within two days of the first date. Oh, Mama, if only you'd known what dating looked like in the 2000s. We went on several sober dates that summer, but he was leaving for Miami in the fall, so we both knew what it was and what it wasn't. By mid-August, I quit answering his texts and phone calls and put him on limited Facebook access. He eventually stopped checking in with me. Replying to him now would have required facing my own personal shame, which I was comfortably wearing like a sweater. Thank you very much. Delete. I scanned through a couple vendor invoices and then spotted an email from griffinflow86 at gmail.com. Dear Ms. Jones, I regret to inform you that there seems to have been a snafu at your recent event at the Dallas Arboretum and Botanical Garden. Somehow, a rogue swan attached itself to one of our delightfully rustic chic rowboats. We're investigating the matter. In the meantime, please accept this altered version of reality, sans swan boat. Sincerely, Griffin Flores and the DABG. Probably. P.S. I'm sorry for what happened and hope you don't get into too much trouble. I chuckled quietly, saved the edited photo to send to Gemma, and fired off a reply. Dear Mr. Flores, while your skillfully modified photograph might not be sufficient to save this lowly assistant planner's position, I am certain that the happy couple will appreciate your documenting the day as it existed in their imagination. Gratefully, Lottie Jones. P.S. Thanks for helping me paddle. And for this. Smiley face. I looked up, and Mary Ellen was hovering over my desk. Lottie, let's chat. Before she could tear into me, I tried to explain. The boat had come untied from when the interns put it into place, so I had to go get it before everybody came down there. I still don't understand how a giant bird got stuck to the back. Well, that was the only other boat left on the lake, so we used it to bring the dinghy back, and then forgot it because we were so focused on getting the boat tied up and ourselves hidden before the guests arrived. Who was helping you? One of Val's new assistants, the one with puppy dog eyes and great hair. Hmm. 
I see. She pursed her lips a moment. Well, fortunately for you, Gemma's family thought the whole thing was some hilarious prank by the groomsmen. I started to explain that it was a mistake, but they were so charmed by the whole thing that I decided not to burst their bubble. Cedric played along, too, when they handed him an extra tip for the added amusement. Go figure. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. So, I'm not fired? Did I say that out loud? I just said it out loud. No, just try to keep waterfowl out of the picture from now on. Literally. With a less weird family, this could have been a real issue. It ruined the final image of the wedding that will be ingrained upon every guest's mind. With these kinds of clients, there can be no more slip-ups. They pay us a small fortune to provide perfection, or at least the illusion of it. I assumed the extra tip would never make its way to my pockets, and considered it the cost of not losing my job. Mary Ellen wasn't known for her magnanimity, or collegial attitude, to put it mildly. She'd made multiple assistants and vendors cry. One of our rental companies wouldn't work with her because she'd made too many of their assistants cry as well. But she was an amazing saleswoman. She could, as they say, sell oceanfront property in Arizona, which was good and bad. It became clear very quickly that Mary Ellen, like Cedric, would tell clients that anything was possible and then expect everyone who worked for her to deliver on that promise, no matter how ridiculous. Of course, the weddings always came together. Promises were delivered, and not one bride below the Mason-Dixon line didn't want to work with them. Two days later, I was making phone calls at my desk, finding a baker who could make a gluten-free vegan wedding cake that didn't taste like earwax was proving futile. It shouldn't be impossible in this day and age. But telling Mary Ellen I'd failed to track down a bride's must-have wasn't an option either. As I started to dial yet another dead end, Cedric stormed into the open office area. Attention, ladies! He wrapped a Baccarat crystal tumbler against the wall of the nearest cubicle and anxiously shuffled his blue suede Hermes loafers. Always with the Hermes. I need everybody to come in here, chop-chop! He led the way to one of the two large client meeting rooms in the front office. Each room was wrapped in gold, gracie, hand-painted floral wallpaper that cost as much as a luxury vehicle. White velvet curtains embellished with red tassel trimmings framed large frosted windows. Natural light poured in, but no one could see the parking lot. Massive, flat-screen TVs displayed images from Cedric's past events on a constant loop and often helped banish any hesitation. If the on-hand Piper Heidsike hadn't done the trick before signing a contract. Once satisfied that the team was assembled, Cedric cleared his throat so gratingly that I almost offered to give him the Heimlich maneuver. No. Everybody knows that my partner, Jeffrey Berry, is opening a new luxury spa retreat center near the Chattahoochee National Forest. Yes, Cedric. We all knew because you pasted copies of the Garden and Gun article in the break room and both bathrooms. As he begins to spend more time in that area, I've decided to do so as well. The time at the spa and with Jeff will do me good, seeing as I stress too much and work too hard and run myself ragged with this business. He paused to stare pointedly at each of us. I'll be able to unwind and get in touch with nature, like hiking and things of that sort. And I can focus more on building our dream home there and establishing our social calendar. I struggled to envision Cedric hiking through the hills, a dust-covered Hermes cravat at his throat. But because I'll be down there more, I've decided to expand our business. Atlanta is exploding. Now it's no Dallas, but many big companies are based down there, not to mention the movie and TV people, music execs, and tech billionaires who have also come to town. They may not have tickets to the symphony or a box at Truist Park to watch the Braves, but they have private jets and houses in Malibu, and the best Real Housewives franchise in my humble opinion and they want weddings to rival Sean Parker's or Beyonce's. So, what this means for you, darlings, is that we're opening a second office of Cedric Montclair celebrations in Atlanta. 
He paused for a dramatic effect. No one clapped. We just looked at each other, unsure how to respond. Cedric shook his head as if we were children whose development was significantly behind expectations, then continued. We're aiming to launch the office next spring, so over the next couple months, we will begin the process of setting everything up and utilizing our existing vendor relationships. None of this should really trouble you all, but I am going to be restructuring how we run things around here and making some big hires, including a lead planner to run that office. So, everybody be sure and bring your A-game to our current slate of clients. I'd much rather promote from within and avoid having to completely retrain everyone. God knows I spent enough time turning all of you into functional humans. Well, that is all. Any questions? Good. He clapped twice and retreated to his office. I stood, mind racing. Sure, the lead planner job in Atlanta would go to Mary Ellen if she wanted it, but I looked around the room and could see the staffing dominoes that would fall after her promotion. By spring, I could be in a position to move into one of the lead planner roles here. After that, the boost in salary, and actually keeping the client's tips, could make a big difference for my student loans. Plus, a girl had needs, like sensible shoes and cash for tacos. I might even be able to move into my own place. I loved living with Natalia, but if I really wanted to prove that I could make it on my own, even that would have to end eventually. In my mind's eye, I imagined purchasing a new wardrobe, signing up for dating apps that cost money, meeting the husband of my wish list, and finding my life completely changed by my 30th birthday. Later, I sidled up to Abigail at the sleek marble countertop bar in Cedric's version of a break room. The Nespresso machine gleamed. I credited him with teaching me the difference between a latte, an Americano, and a flat white. The fridge was stocked with nine different types of milk and dairy alternatives, although the skim and cashew were not so subtly positioned at the front of the shelf and more frequently restocked as an encouragement. I usually used a splash of half and half out of spite. This Memphis girl didn't do nut milk. Abigail perused the snack basket. Her dark braids today plated down her back in typical laid-back yet impossibly chic style. Kashi bars, chia seed packets, fresh fruit, and ethically sourced turkey jerky were the day's offerings. I often made a lunch of whatever was available. God knew the trustees weren't indulging, so I felt it was my duty to make sure the food didn't go to waste. We often had thank you gifts of food sent to us by clients, and they invariably made their way to the break room counter too. Magnolia cupcakes and Jacques Torres chocolates were a current favorite, but I wasn't picky when it came to sugar. I grabbed a local baker's crispy rice treat and leaned against the bar next to Abigail. So, big news today, huh? I said tentatively. Hmm? Yeah, I guess so. She sounded distracted. This is great news for you and the other partners, right? I crunched too loudly into my snack. Yes, if it succeeds in bringing in more business. It's also a lot of additional overhead. So I'm worried about how everything will work out. Cedric will have a new lease, staffing needs, insurance, and so on. A lot of logistics to manage. Have you thought about who you'll ask to go there? I hope you know how much I've appreciated getting to work with you and learn from you. It's meant a lot that you were willing to bring me with you when you came to Cedric's team. There. I'd probably shown my hand too quickly. Lottie, you know I think you're a fantastic asset to the team. But? Do you want my honest advice? Yes, I think so. Honesty was one thing I had always been able to count on from Abigail. You're a hard worker. You're more organized and reliable than anyone I've ever worked with, which is why I promoted you at my shop. But you just started here. There's a whole staff of junior and senior planners and even assistants who have been here years longer than you. So you've really got to stand out between now and next spring. I'm your biggest advocate, but Cedric will make the call. You've also got to work to impress his other key people, like Mary Ellen. She's not usually inclined to like staffers she didn't directly hire or groom herself, so you'll have to really hustle to win her over. Abigail started reaching for a Snickers bar, 
cut her eyes at me, and put her hand back on the counter. Thanks for the insight. I recognized my cue to let her get back to the snack tray. Please let me know if you think of anything else, or have other tips between now and then. You know I will. I'm rooting for you. It sounded like I shouldn't start looking at studio apartments just yet, but at least I had a roadmap. I walked back to my desk in the pod, musing. I passed Claire and the other trustees huddled together still gossiping about Cedric's news. Savannah, a redhead from Houston, painted her nails carelessly on the clear acrylic of her desk. Those girls had no idea what was coming for them. Now, let's hear a sample of A Place to Land. A hidden past isn't past at all. Violet Fig and her sister Trudy have lived a quiet life in Sugar Bend, Alabama, since a night 40 years ago that stole Trudy's voice and cemented Violet's role as her sister's fierce and loyal protector. Now Trudy spends her days making sculptures from found objects and speaking through notes written on scraps of paper, while Violet runs their art shop, monitors bird activity up and down the water, and tries not to think of the one great love she gave up to keep her sister safe. 18-year-old Maya knows where everyone else belongs, but she's been searching for her own place since her grandmother died seven years ago. Moving in and out of strangers' houses has left her exhausted. After seeing a flyer on a gas station window for a place called Sugar Bend, Maya chooses to follow the strange pull she feels and finds herself on the doorstep of an art shop called Two Sisters. When a boat rises to the surface of Little River in the middle of the night, the present and no longer buried past collide, and the future becomes uncertain for Maya, Violet, and Trudy. As history creeps continuously closer to the present and old secrets come to light, the sisters must decide to face the truth of what happened that night 40 years ago, or risk losing each other and those they've come to love. USA Today best-selling author Laura K. Denton delivers another distinctly Southern story that shimmers with beauty and possibility. A Place to Land is a full-length Southern women's fiction standalone novel, and it includes discussion questions for book clubs. Now, let's hear a sample of A Place to Land, narrated by Brittany Presley. Sugar Bend has always been known as a place of secrets and mystery. In this small town nestled alongside Little River, words spoken in confidence turn to mist, evaporating before anyone else can take notice of them. Fish swim against the current, pushing themselves deeper into the rich river water, even as the tide sweeps everything else out into the gulf. Morning doves float on the water's early morning surface like ducks, as if the water were a safer place than land. And long gone memories, thick as the rain heavy air, tend to come back at the strangest of times, as sharp and clear as if they'd only just happened. The town of Sugar Bend sprouted in a cozy crook of the river over a century ago, and its people built stores and homes along the thin ribbon of brackish water. Now, lazy roads fan out on either side of it, full of candy-colored houses, birds that chirp in the middle of the night, and dogs that crisscross the road in search of the tastiest handouts. But on the edge of town, the secrets deepen along with the river, and as the water grows shadowy under tree-dappled shade, the mysteries darken as well. For way down deep in the murky blue-green depths, a little boat sleeps. Forty years ago, it was laid to rest in its silent, watery burial ground by a pair of strong hands. Hands that belonged to a girl whose life was irrevocably changed in the span of one steamy, glass-calm night. Part One, Lift. 
One. On a quiet silver morning, before the world, or at least the rest of Sugar Bend, had awoken, Violet Fig took in the spirited bird song from her back porch overlooking Little River. She wrapped her hands around her mug of tea and closed her eyes to listen. There by the steps was the three-part whistle of a Carolina wren. Up in the scrubby oak along the side of the porch was the soft coo-oo of a morning dove. A great blue heron squawked as it landed at the edge of the grass and lifted its head high atop its skinny neck. At the quick, squeaky chit-chit coming from near the back steps, Violet smiled. She'd started seeing the ruby-throated hummingbirds a few weeks ago, back in town from their yearly jaunt down to Mexico and other parts farther south. She was always happy to see them return. This morning, there were two of them, a male and a female, with wings that beat so fast they all but disappeared. Where the male had iridescent green feathers on his back and the telltale bright red throat, the female's feathers were paler green, and she was missing that trademark ruby red. What she did have was a splotch on the underside of her neck that resembled a sun with brilliant rays shooting out from the center. This particular hummingbird had visited Violet's feeders last season, and possibly the one before that, too. Trudy didn't believe her, but Violet knew her birds. Getting a little breakfast before you start your day, huh? Violet rose and placed her hand against the screen, and the female turned her head toward Violet's voice. Well, hello to you, too, she murmured. She'd mix up a new batch of nectar for them when she returned from her morning survey. She glanced at her watch. Still had a little time. At a rustle behind her, the birds took one last sip, then flew away, and Violet turned to see her sister lean in through the doorway that led from the kitchen onto the porch. Trudy's blue-striped pajamas were rumpled, and she rubbed a hand over her eyes as she yawned. At one time in her life, Trudy Fig wouldn't have stepped out of the house without her long blonde hair meticulously brushed and rolled, eyeliner in a perfect cat eye, and lips lined and glossed. She'd sheathed her lovely form in all manner of sparkly gowns and bikinis in her quest to win every beauty pageant she entered, which for the most part she had. The gowns and bikinis were long gone, along with all traces of makeup, hair products, and her voice. But her face was still beautiful. As much as Trudy tried to run from it, it was hard to hide the still bright eyes, Cupid's bow lips, and smooth cheeks, despite her 63 years. Today, Trudy sported a particularly impressive bedhead, with short gray-brown curls sticking out all over. And knowing Trudy, she wouldn't even try to tame it before shoving a hat on her head and heading out on her daily treasure hunt. Pausing in the doorway, Trudy tapped her watch and tilted her head in question. I'm always up early. Over the years, Violet had learned to decipher her sister's unspoken communication, and she often knew what Trudy was thinking even when Trudy didn't reach for the ever-present notepad and pencil she kept in her pocket. Violet nodded toward the bird feeder hanging on the other side of the screen. I saw sunshine this morning. It was her nickname for the hummingbird with the sun rays on her neck. She found her way back. Trudy had already pulled out her notepad and was scratching out a note. When she finished, she held it out for Violet to read. With all those birds crisscrossing the skies during migrations, what makes you think you have repeat visitors? Violet shrugged. It happens. Trudy threw out a skeptical glance, but Violet pushed it away. The birds know a good thing when they see it, and they've been known to go back to the same feeder year after year. She nudged her glasses up on the bridge of her nose. Regardless, they're here and I like it. Violet faced out toward the river and the wide sky above it. Clear as a bell, light breeze. An osprey swooped over the river, a fish dangling in its talons. Behind her, Trudy began to ride again. 
I'm going to the island before the tide comes back in. Don't call the Coast Guard on me like you did last time. I wish you'd take your phone. Violet wrapped her arms around herself. Early May in Alabama wasn't cold by any stretch, but she felt a chill nonetheless. Those teenagers on the jet skis make me nervous. And the drunk fishermen? You know how they race each other to get out into the gulf. A corner of Trudy's mouth lifted in a grin as she wrote, Not too many teenagers out before seven in the morning, and fishermen won't start drinking until lunchtime. Violet opened her mouth to rattle off another reason why it wasn't safe for Trudy to be out on the water alone, but Trudy began writing again. I'm a big girl, Violet. You don't always have to watch out for me. I'll be just fine. And with that, Trudy winked, then ducked back into the house. Just fine, Violet murmured, her gaze still on the spot where Trudy had been standing. I do have to watch out for you, she thought. It's my job. With Trudy gone, the porch seemed more still than usual. Trudy had been quiet for 40 years, but even in her silence, she could be loud, at least with Violet. Sometimes she seemed to nearly vibrate with life, but she refused to open her mouth and let any of it out. Violet would have been happy with anything. A shout of anger, a burst of laughter, a single word. There were times, just after everything had happened, when Violet fought the urge to grab Trudy by the shoulders and demand she speak, or at least explain on that blasted notepad why she couldn't even say a word to Violet. The rest of the world, okay, but to her own sister, her only family. But Violet had learned to let that go. She heaved a lungful of air and slowly let it leak out. Violet loved her sister with every fiber, every shred of her being. And though the past crept back in sometimes, pressing on her shoulders and jabbing her in the stomach with its long, scabby fingers, Violet no longer allowed herself to think about all she'd given up. For love and for obligation. For penance. Violet settled down in her rocking chair, the floral cushion shaped from years of her back porch bird watching, and pushed off gently, setting the rocker into a slow back and forth. Before her, the sky over the river brightened by small increments, a splash of mauve here, a streak of pink there. A little while later, Trudy crossed the yard below. Dressed in a pair of black swim shorts and a yellow t-shirt, Trudy, Violet's sole companion for all these years, lugged her kayak under one arm and a bucket for her treasures in the other. The last time she'd gone to Robert's Island, she'd brought home a three-foot piece of gnarly driftwood, now well on its way to becoming a quirky lamp, which their customers would no doubt love and fight each other for. The bucket was too small for wood that large, but it'd be perfect for the shells and dried pods and fronds Trudy was always picking up and toting home. Violet and Trudy owned and operated Two Sisters Art and Handmade Goods in downtown Sugar Bend. What started as a place for Trudy to make and sell her popular mixed-media art pieces had grown over the years into a shop where patrons could find just right gifts for any occasion. Trudy's unconventional sculptures were always a big hit, and their inventory also included everything from hand-thrown pottery to small canvas paintings to handmade soap, candles, and door wreaths. Aside from just an art shop, two sisters had become somewhat of a gathering spot for people who needed rest and community. Men whose wives were busy shopping, lonely seniors who craved company and conversation, even a few book clubs and knitting circles— Violet and Trudy had bought the shop eight years ago from the previous owners, who'd had to sell quickly for a song. Trudy had been selling her artwork at the annual art festival for years, but having a brick-and-mortar space allowed her to sell her wares all through the year, rather than in one hectic weekend. It also gave her a place to spread out her materials and work, without covering their home with sand and splinters of wood. Or, 
at least not as much as she used to. Downstairs, Trudy stepped into the shallow water alongside their dock and slid the kayak in, then carefully sat and picked up the double-bladed paddle. Only when she began paddling, her strong arms pulling the kayak through the glass surface of the river, did Violet stand to ready herself for her morning bird survey. But just as she reached for her mug, a strange sensation washed through her, like ice water rippling under her skin. She paused, then turned to the screen door and pushed it open. There, on the top step, as if someone had laid it there just for her, was a complete set of fish bones. Violet's breath rushed out and her skin tingled, a chill shooting up her arms and across the back of her neck. The skeleton was about as long as the width of her hand. It had a head with a gaping hole where the eye had once been, a spine with slender ribs sticking out, and at the end, the wispy, fragile bones of a small tail fin. Despite living mere feet from the river and just a few miles from the Gulf of Mexico, the sight of the bones didn't bring to mind the river teeming with life or the many fish she'd grilled, fried, or baked over the years. Instead, she remembered the last day she'd seen him. He'd been wearing a crisp navy suit, starched white shirt, shiny wingtip shoes, and the girl on his arm, Trudy, in a red dress, matching lipstick and an anxious smile, and his trademark cufflinks, tiny silver fish bones winking in the light. In a quick, angry motion, Violet scraped the bones off the top step with the sole of her slipper, and they landed with a dull clatter in the sawgrass growing next to the porch. Dropping to a half crouch, knees aching, heart pounding, she swiveled her head, expecting to see him looming on the dock or in the grass or behind her on the porch. But nothing was there. No one watching. Just a dewy morning stretching out its arms, unconcerned by the warning bells ringing in Violet's ears. Several years ago, when Violet first began taking bird surveys for the Coastal Alabama Audubon Society, she'd wake up ludicrously early on survey days, nervously checking and rechecking her small backpack to make sure she had everything she needed. Binoculars and camera, clipboard with plenty of data sheets, three pens in case her first two ran out of ink, visor, and official birding t-shirt. It was so important to her, this process of observing, counting, and monitoring the birds she'd loved for so long, that she grew shaky and nauseated. Oftentimes her anxiety was so bad that when she finally made it to the beach and the beginning of her route, her hands would tremble, and the data she was supposed to collect would disappear as soon as she'd try to write it down. It was different now, thank goodness. She'd learned to relax into it, to remember she was dealing with the natural world, where things didn't always go according to plan. It wasn't the plans she cared about anyway. The checklists and routines, the data sheets and computer logs. It was the birds themselves. Their effortless flight through the sky, the ease with which they changed course. Even as a young child, Violet had watched everything from the tiniest blue-gray gnat catchers with the squeaky calls to the white ibises and great horned owls that soared over her childhood home. Each species was different. Violet was able to identify most birds in her backyard by the time she was seven or eight years old. But they all had one thing in common. Total freedom. Violet loved nothing more than to watch her birds, as she thought of them, calling and cackling, foraging and flying, all with the ease and freedom of a creature not bound by anything but the needs of its own little body and brain. Nothing stopped them. Watching them fly was always the balm she didn't know she needed. Today, after a breakfast of oatmeal and a handful of blueberries, she grabbed her trusty backpack, always stocked with the essentials to prevent the nervous checking of her earlier years, 
and drove south out of Sugar Bend toward the coast. Though the stretch of white sand fronting the Gulf of Mexico had been virtually empty when she was a girl, it was now lined with overpriced restaurants, trendy boutiques, boat rental shacks, and tall, glittering condos. But despite the constant forward motion of progress, the birds were still there, and it was Violet's duty and pleasure to keep her eye on them. She parked at the resort, as she always did, and passed between the two condo towers. She'd walked the path between these condos so often, she'd worn the grass down to sandy dirt. But the man in the resort's guardhouse always looked the other way when she approached with her binoculars and camera around her neck, her wide green visor shading her face and neck from the unforgiving Alabama sun. A sign proclaimed this portion of beach reserved for registered guests only, but it had been years since he'd asked for her room number. She'd even taught him a little about identifying the birds he saw flying past his windowed box by the entrance gate. Poor man, Violet often thought, stuck inside that cramped little space with frigid air pumped out of the window unit, his only company a tiny TV in the corner, and out-of-towners who pulled through the gate all day. He probably thought similar things about her, Poor woman, all alone out in the heat, with only some birds to keep her company. Today, he tipped his cap in greeting as she slid through the gap in the gate and continued to the path between towers A and B. It was still early, only 7.15, but the sun was already hot, the sky a clear stretch of pale blue all the way to the horizon. She pulled the brim of her visor a little lower as she came out of the shade between the buildings, and stepped up onto the wooden walkway that spanned the dunes. At the end of the bridge was a small bench, and as she deposited her shoes there, she was grateful to see hers was the only pair. The beachgoers were still in their rooms eating breakfast and slathering themselves with sunscreen. She still had some time before things got busy. As always, when her bare feet finally met the sand, she paused and dug in, savoring the cool cushion that crept between her toes. People talked about the healing properties of salt water. She remembered her mother once telling her to take a mouthful of gulf water and gargle it to soothe a sore throat. But in Violet's mind, the real healing was in the sand. When she reached the firm, damp sand close to the water, she paused and took her clipboard from her backpack she lifted the waterproof cover page and wrote the date and her name, then jotted down initial notes on the conditions. A quick look around with her binoculars, and she noted a group of birds to her left. Royal terns, three, juvenile. Violet had been volunteering with the local Audubon chapter for years. She attended lectures about bird migrations and endangered species, and volunteered occasionally at the local nature center mostly keeping kids from sticking their fingers through the bars of the injured bird habitats. She'd taken an early retirement from teaching a little over ten years ago, when Sugar Bend Academy merged with a larger school in the next town, which freed her up to accompany more seasoned volunteers on their regular bird surveys. After a while, she was given an official clipboard and her own route. Her job was to walk a one-mile stretch of beach, observing counting and identifying all birds, whether on land, water, or in the air. During each survey season, volunteers were charged with recording and logging official data once a week, and Violet fulfilled her duty in rain or shine, heat or chill, and filled out the data sheets in her still perfect teacher's penmanship. Today, she kept her binoculars at the ready as she made her way down the beach, she moved cautiously, careful not to disturb the birds as they went about the business of their daily lives. For each bird she saw, she made a hatch mark on the bottom of her data sheet, noting the bird's color, age, and sex. It was a morning for the laughing gulls, with several colonies dotting the beach and floating in the shallow water just beyond the gentle waves. The gulls always added a particular zip to the day, with their cackling laughter and slashes of black and white against the azure sky. When a string of runners passed her, 
The birds took flight at once, their laughter carrying over the sound of the waves and the stiff breeze. Violet did a quick count, mentally untangling the wings into individual bodies, and noted their particulars. All juveniles, mostly females. She continued on her route, making notes and occasionally pausing to dip her toes into the water. The time passed quickly as it always did when she was enjoying herself. When she reached the yellow chair rental stand that signaled the turnaround point of her route, she adjusted the brim of her visor to block the sun, then headed back the way she came, continuing her observations until she reached her starting point. She made a few last notes on her sheet, including two birds she couldn't easily identify, which was rare for her, and finally tucked her clipboard into her backpack. Back at the foot of the walkway where she'd left her shoes, she took the water hose looped over the handrail and rinsed the sand from her feet and legs. As chilly water ran down her calves and cooled the skin of her feet, something rustled behind her. She turned just in time to see a large brown pelican stretch out its wings and take flight from the back of the bench. The magnificence of seeing the bird's huge, prehistoric wingspan up close blotted out all else, and she stood still, watching the bird as it soared away from her. It swooped low over the beach, then glided even lower over the rolling waves, its wings flapping only once or twice as the ground effect kept it aloft. Finally, it came to rest on the water, pulling its wings into its sides and bobbing on the surface. Violet's skin thrummed when the pelican cocked its head and glanced over its shoulder to where she stood, hose dangling in her fingertips and her toes turning cold from the flow of water. She reached behind her and turned off the faucet, keeping her eyes on the pelican. A burst of conversation came from her right. She dragged her gaze away from the bird and took a step back as a family bustled by, juggling four folding chairs, two inflatable rafts, a large cooler, and a string bag holding all manner of sandcastle building gear. Two children, a boy and a girl, trailed the parents, their faces shiny with sunscreen and glee. When the boisterous parade finally passed, Violet closed her eyes and inhaled the salty air. It invigorated, energized. It whispered and sang. It's not just the sand that's healing, she thought. It's the air, too. When she opened her eyes, her gaze snagged on something lying on the handrail at the top of the bench, right where the pelican had perched moments before. Fish bones. Though much smaller than those sitting on her top step this morning, the skeleton was unmistakable. Her eyes darted to the water, but the pelican was gone. When Violet arrived at Two Sisters a couple hours later, her skin and hair fresh from a shower and dressed in her usual drawstring khaki skirt and cool, loose-fitting linen top, Trudy was already hard at work, bent over the long table in the back, her green banker's lamp illuminating her workspace. Violet recognized some of the items spread out on the table, the long piece of driftwood from a few days ago, clumps of dried seaweed, and the ever-present tangle of fishing line. But there were some new additions Trudy must have found on that morning's scavenge. A bouquet of sea oat pods, a bundle of reedy grass, and a handful of clamshells. Starting a new project today? Trudy's answer was a nod, her eyes not lifting from the fishing line she threaded through a string of shells. Sometimes Violet didn't understand why her sister didn't just buy a fresh spool of fishing line. It'd be so much easier to attach the shells and baubles together if she didn't have to untangle the line first. But Trudy was adamant about using cast-off materials, items others had discarded, along with left-behind shells and bits of broken wood. Forgotten, abandoned things. Trudy calmed them down and put them together, and made them beautiful again. Violet made her way through the shop, bringing it to life. She powered up the computer, filled the electric tea kettle and flipped it on, 
then set the music to low and twisted the rod to open the window blinds. Mismatched chairs set up at round tables under the large bay window waited for the day's customers. As the water in the kettle began to bubble, Violet propped open the front door to catch the last of the morning's breeze before it turned too hot. Ella Fitzgerald crooned east of the sun, and the shop was ready for the day. Sugar Bend wasn't exactly a tourist town. There were no outlet malls, high-end boutiques, or five-star restaurants. But it was known for its quaintness, its beauty, its winding roads draped with cool shade and Spanish moss, and its annual art festival held at the end of every summer. Vacationers from nearby Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, and Pensacola often made their way up the highway, usually well into their week-long vacations, when their skin needed a break from the sun, in search of the hidden turns and overlooked signs that took them to Sugar Bend, population 1,923. It wasn't by accident that the roads were hard to find, and the signs occasionally went missing. Still, some made it in, and when they did, they faced two types of locals. One type bemoaned the out-of-towners, who came for a dose of small-town charm to take back to their regular lives. They barked at the cars that went the wrong way down one-way streets, rolled their eyes at college spring breakers who had the nerve to order a half-calf sugar-free, could you add a double shot of espresso, mochaccinos at Joe's Coffee on Cedar Street, and pretended to be cash only when people pulled out their debit cards. Then there were those who welcomed strangers in with open arms, who were willing to share Sugar Ben's beauty and magic with outsiders, who gave directions and let them pay however they liked. For the most part, Trudy and Violet fell into the second camp. After all, if someone wanted to take a piece of Sugar Bend with them when they left, why shouldn't that be a hand-painted oyster shell with gold leaf edges or a whimsical sculpture made from driftwood, sea glass, and coquina shells? Violet would wave goodbye as the visitors walked out of two sisters, content in the knowledge that while they might be taking home a small piece of Sugar Bend, the true secrets of the town and of the river that flowed through it were known only to the real locals, those like Trudy and Violet, who'd loved and lost in this place, who'd wept here, who'd been broken and fastened back together all along these shores and roads and under these shade trees. By early afternoon, Trudy was finished with her work. My materials are not cooperating, she'd scrawled on a note, and Violet had sold a dozen of their best-selling pinch pots, the little containers, perfect for holding small odds and ends on a dresser or by the kitchen sink, were made from river clay Trudy had shaped and fired. When they cooled, Violet glazed them to resemble birds' eggs. Brown and cream speckled for nut hatches, bright blue-green for robins, a mottled gray-brown for sparrows, pale blue with scattered dark spots for house finches. As Violet wrapped up a sail, Trudy appeared at Violet's elbow, holding a note. I'm heading home. I'll get things ready for dinner. Violet nodded at her sister. I won't be too long. I'll probably close around four. Most shops in town had fluctuating hours, and no one but outsiders minded. With her messenger bag tight across her chest and her tackle box of supplies in hand, Trudy slipped quietly out the door and headed west on Water Street toward home. Violet took off her glasses and cleaned the lenses with the hem of her shirt. As she put them back on, a young woman paused outside the front window. Long, dark hair fell in waves down her back, one side tucked behind a delicate ear. Proud nose, full lips, and wide, long-lashed eyes scampered this way and that, as if she was searching for someone. She seemed too young for the worried crease between her brows. After a moment of hesitation, the girl opened the door and walked in. The bell jangled a happy tune. Welcome to Two Sisters, Violet smiled warmly. Are you shopping for anything particular? 
The girl shook her head and ran her fingers across a set of dish towels splashed with bright yellow flowers on a table by the door. Well, I'm here if you need me. Violet puttered around, dusting shelves and neatening up displays. She kept an eye on the new customer as she moved through the shop, her face still etched with concern. What was roiling inside her, itching to be freed? The girl lifted the lid of a shell-encrusted box, barely larger than a deck of cards. The inside was lined with pale pink velvet. My sister Trudy made that. Violet's words startled the girl, who dropped the lid closed. Violet tried to set her at ease. She collects little things everywhere she goes. Shells, pieces of wood, bits of twine and feathers, and she uses it all in her artwork. Many of the sculptures and art pieces here are hers. I like them. Her voice was deeper than Violet had expected. Mature. Violet had guessed her age to be 15 or 16. But now she wasn't sure. I'll tell her you said that. Where are you from? Violet was sure she'd never seen the girl. And at this point in her life, she knew most everyone in Sugar Bend, if not by name, at least by face. The girl didn't answer. Are you here on vacation? Violet prodded. Not really. She fingered the lid of the box again. Trudy usually sits at that table back there to work. Those are her supplies. Violet gestured to the shelves that held everything Trudy needed to make her sculptures. Clear jars for salvaged sea glass, shells, small pieces of driftwood, and bundles of dried sea grasses. A few rolling pins she wrapped with fishing line once she untangled the snarls, and large plastic bins that held the bigger pieces of driftwood. Next to them were her tools, a spool of wire, scissors, wire cutters, a scattering of beads, and the ever-present knot of fishing line. Are you an artist? The way the girl's eyes lit up when she saw Trudy's things made Violet wonder. But the girl just shook her head and went back to browsing. A few minutes later, the bell at the door jingled. Violet lifted her head from where she was wiping the counter under the tea kettle and saw the girl walking out, one hand stuffed in her pocket. Violet called out a goodbye, and the girl glanced back over her shoulder, but kept her feet moving purposefully in the other direction. Later, as Violet did one last walk through of the shop before she switched off the lights and locked up, she noticed the little shell box was gone. After dinner, Violet organized her backpack while Trudy sat at the dining table, hard at work. Trudy kept the bulk of her materials at the shop, but she used a tackle box to transport home the ones she wanted to continue working on at night. That night, she'd toted home the most uncooperative materials from the morning. The dried seaweed and clunky clam shells, and she'd spread them out on the table, along with part of an old green fishing net and a length of chicken wire she'd pulled from the sand under their dock. It was a strange combination, even for Trudy but she had a way with raw materials like that. She'd ponder and squint and move pieces around until they spoke to her and told her what they wanted to be. At least, that was how Trudy had explained it when that perky writer from Bay Magazine interviewed her last year. The woman acted like there was some kind of magic to it, the taking of random, broken bits and swirling them around until they became something altogether different. Trudy had scoffed and flipped to a new page in her notepad. I'm an old woman, and I like to make things with my hands. It's a hobby, not magic. But it was much more than just a hobby for Trudy. Violet knew that. It was why Violet never complained when she sat in a dining chair and felt the crunch of a forgotten seashell underneath her. Or when Trudy lugged home a driftwood log, leaving behind a scrum of fine sand all over the heart pine floors or the cool tile floors of the shop. Trudy and Violet both navigated.